Welcome to JSA TV and JSA Podcast, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Jean-Marc Slim, and joining me today from London is Louisa Gregory, Vice President of Culture, Change, and Diversity at Call Technology Services. Um, Louisa, welcome to JSA. How are you doing? <laughs> How's the last 18 months treated you? Oh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me uh, to be part of this. Um, and great today, although it is a bit of a, a grey day here in, in London. But uh, yeah, the, the last 18 months have been as challenging for me as they have been for everybody, but looking forward to restrictions really easing up. Yeah, uh, and I guess the weather in London, I mean, what's a day in London without a bit of a grey sky? <laughs> True. <laughs> um, but look, let's jump right in. Um, in terms of diversity and inclusion, how would you define diversity in the corporate world today? Um, and what would you say are the main challenges that still affect our industry? Yeah, so, so two questions really in, in that. And I think um, for us at Colt, we think about diversity as not just diversity of, of types of people, uh, which obviously it is, but what we're really aiming to achieve by bringing in uh, diverse talent, including more women, more people from different ethnic backgrounds, or you know, even people who have uh, both visible and invisible disabilities, LGBTQ+, but it's really about bringing in that diversity of thought um, and innovation and creativity to the organisation. Um, and there's lots of research and studies that show that if you are an homogenous team, then you, uh, you, know, you, you won't be as productive, you won't be as, as innovative. And you know, at Colt, we've definitely seen some of that. We're a global organization. Uh, we operate across 23 different countries and we definitely get the benefit of diversity of thought based on just that. So if we can increase it even more, um, then that's really only a good thing for, for, our, um, for our organization. But I think in terms of the, the challenges, um, it's still a business in, imperative. And I think more and more organisations, particularly in our sector, are starting to recognise um, that. Um, but there's still, there's still a long way, <coughs> excuse me, a long way to go. So, you know, we know from a, a study done by Entity Data in just February of this year that women <coughs> make up an average of 35% of the workforce um, of the five leading telco companies in the UK. So it's still a reasonably low percentage mm -hmm. given that women make up at least 50% of the, of the normal population. We also know, and this is one of the things that we've talked about quite a lot at Colt, is that because of the age of our sector, and we've tended to have people who come in and join this exciting new startup sector called telecommunications, and they've stuck with it, but they're now reaching retirement age. So we have a bit of a retirement cliff approaching as well. So the challenge is really to bring in that young, diverse talent. They want that social mobility. They want to see, you know, organisations that are focused on changing the world, that are focused on winning together and, um, and doing things a different way or a better way. So uh, we just need to be more diverse in order to attract that new talent. Yeah, get the millennials and then the Generation Z <laughs> through the door, um, which value different things that the old generations did before. I mean, I really like the, the, the thought around diversity of thinking um, and bringing different aspects to detail, because I guess over the years, um, at least in my six years as a journalist, when we started talking about diversity, it was very much about we need more women. Um, mm -hmm. No one really talked about the other verticals of diversity. I don't know if we can call them verticals, but hope that's not. Um, a real we call thing. them pillars. So the pillars, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, the different pillars of diversity. So I think that's a very good point. And uh, do you think the market is still kind of held back a little bit by the thinking that um, diversity it's pretty much exclusively about bringing more women into the, the into the telecom space, rather than this wider pool of talent that we have across a wider pillar spectrum. <laughs> Yeah, I, well, certainly not for cult. I mean, yeah, you call them, on a we call them we call them pillars. That you know, same same thing. And I think what I'm seeing is the more and more the industry bodies that support this sector. So, group like the global groups like the Global Leaders Forum as part of um, capacity, and groups like the TM Forum, um, they are they have been focused on bringing more women in because it's an easy place to start. Mm. It's a, you know, it's often a binary decision. You're, you're male or you're, you're female. It's, it's more of an obvious distinction. 
Um, but more and more, particularly in those sort of industry groups where they bring the sector together, there are a lot more conversations around neurodiversity, around race, around how we bring more people from ethnic minorities in. Um, and, you know, clearly the whole murder of George Floyd last year changed the conversation landscape when it comes to conversations around race. Um, I know the GLF is just about to release their annual report on the status of diversity, inclusion and belonging and will include race for the first time um, this year. So um, I think the industry is changing and it is mm. recognised that we need to be more inclusive uh, around diversity types than, than just women. Um, but these things obviously don't change overnight either. No, no. It takes time, generational. <laughs> yeah. Um, but actually, I mean, you've already, you've said it takes time. You've mentioned George Floyd. Uh, my next question was really around how has the last 18 months changed the conversation around inclusivity and diversity in this sector? Because, uh, I mean, of course, we had George Floyd's last summer, which was sad, but it triggered hopefully some good change um, on the back of it. Um, we have, I mean, we're still dealing with COVID, can't get away from it. Um, there's been some reports where they do say that COVID kind of takes away some of the opportunities for the, the minorities and even women and everything. Um, and then in the UK, we've dealt with Brexit, which also impacted Europe. Um, I mean, the world has been turned upside down over the last it 18 has. months for the good and the bad. But how has it kind of affected um, the topic that we're discussing today? Well, I, I think it's, in, <clears throat> it's increased the engagement on the, on the topic. And the way that I like to think about the last 18 months is we started with this health crisis where people were losing loved ones and family and friends and it was very much a health crisis that led to an economic crisis where you know people were losing jobs or they're going on furlough having to to live on reduced income or there was the threat of unemployment looming in the the future overlaid with as we've already said the murder of George Floyd which you know precipitated this social crisis that many people um, experience, particularly our black colleagues and, and people of colour. And all of that's led to this whole well-being crisis where, you know, there's been a lot more focus on mental health and, you know, how do people cope with things like even the word lockdown, you know, we mm. use words like that, which is, you know, previously we would only have ever heard it for somebody who's physically in jail, you know, they, they go into to lockdown. We don't use those as part of our common um, vocabulary. So, you know, all of these things have really forced us to think differently about how we bring people to the table and how we include um, more people. And, and yes, sadly, there, there are some implications. We know that women are more affected by job loss through COVID, so those companies that have had to downscale, statistically they've let go of more women than they have men. Um, we know that there are some people with certain disabilities who've been more affected um, by not being in the workplace because um, you know, the, the tools and the equipment and the accommodations that they need can't be easily supported in a, in a home environment. There are others who have thrived. There are others who, you know, without that, that commute, the, the world of work is more accessible um, to them as, as well. So there are pros and cons, and I think we just need to be really thoughtful about how we continue to, to think about those different diverse groups um, and make sure that there are no real, real losers. Mm. We personally haven't seen a lot as a result of Brexit. I don't think Brexit has really played into our thinking because we were always a global organisation anyway. Um, but certainly the other, the other things, COVID, working from home, all of those things have had an impact mm. um, that we've had to consider. Mm. Yeah, it will be interesting once COVID is over as well to maybe see a study, a market study, where we can see who was let go, but what kind of position they were also in, because a lot of it might actually be down to, um, I mean, to our old conversation around generational opportunities, uh, where women might not be in positions of power at the moment, and then people at the lower end will probably get the job faster um, than people at the, the, the top. So maybe in the next pandemic, 100 years time down the line, <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> uh, we'll kind of see this a bit more balanced um, in terms of who's let go. Um, but, I mean, you've already mentioned a little bit um, of cult as well, and I wanted to learn more, what kind of initiatives do you have in place uh, within the company itself um, to embrace diversity and inclusivity more? Um, I see a lot of things on LinkedIn sometimes popping out, uh, popping here yeah. and there. Um, so talk us through what you do, um, including with children as well, because I think that's quite interesting. 
Yeah, and for, for Colt, this whole um, journey into, an in, into inclusion and diversity um, for us wasn't as a result of, I mean, I know it's become very mm. talked about in sort of the last 18 months, but we, we were on that train um, but before yeah. that. So some of our programs are, are really embedded, but we do know we've also got a long way um, to go. So if, if we sort of start at the top, we've got a 50-50 gender split at our executive leadership um, level. Um, and inclusion and, diversity, inclusion and diversity, as we call it, makes up one of our strategic priorities at that, that executive leadership and, and board level. So, you know, all of the, the sort of foundations for our brand, for our strategy, for, you know, all of that sort of one of those pillars is um, being more inclusive and, and diverse. But in the last year, we've done um, we've done things like join the Valuable Five Hundred, which is a commitment to supporting people with disability, both visible and in invisible. We've enabled um, an accessibility tool on all of our websites and public spaces called Recite Me, which enables people to change the color. It can even speak to you. You can trans um, translate it into other language. There's all sorts of um, tools there. We have five, uh, sorry, four employee networks to, to, uh, to support our employees with more resources um, around that, including one for our disability awareness network. Hmm. We host lots of events. We've, um, we've made lots of policy improvements. So just in the last year, we've launched um, policies to, around domestic abuse support, transitioning at work, mental health support, and a, and a couple of others um, in there as well, because what we believe is that having those support policies in place is really the foundation um, for, for having more conversations around these things, but also signposting to people what help um, is available. And we've got more coming where we're actually, I think this week, we just launched our menopause at work or menopause support um, resource toolkit as well, because you know, you, it's a, again, it's, a, it's something that impacts a large percentage of the, of the population. So we need to make sure that we're resourced um, appropriately for, for that as well. So, you know, lots and lots of, of things. We've trained our managers on inspiring inclusion. We held a diversity day um, last year. Um, but I, I think that at Colt, we're really, really fortunate that we've got a CEO that believes absolutely passionately in this topic and, and talks very publicly about the need for it as, as well. So, yeah, lots of things. <laughs> I mean, I like as what you've done there, you kind of expanded the word inclusivity to, to much more because I guess out there, there's still a lot of companies that think inclusivity is about just employing one or two women here and then another person from a different background. Um, yeah. So for them, it's very much the tick box exercise. Yeah. Um, while you guys are actually doing things differently and you're educating the other parts of the business as well about the minorities issues. Um, yes. and the problems that other people face so they can actually work together um, as members of staff. And I love the idea of translating within the company's platform. Um, I never <laughs> thought of that. I never thought of that, but it's one of those simple things that actually makes it all much more inclusive because if yeah. I speak to you in a different language and you don't understand what I'm saying, then we're both not being inclusive because we don't understand what we're saying. Um, so yeah. actually offering that to the employees, I think that's really good. Um, but and now talking about you, because you haven't been the vice president for culture change. So I got that wrong, did I? Culture change and diversity. Um, for too long. I think it's been six, eight months. Um, what have you learned since you took to the role? Um, so so I, I guess just to clarify, that's formally, but I've been working for, for Colt in this space for, I guess, a, a little while. We've just kind of formalised it um, okay. since, since January. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, we've, we've learned lots of things and um, this, is, this is a space where you never stop learning. In, in my opinion. So one of the big things that we kind of already knew, but I think that we've definitely highlighted is there really is no silver bullet for being more inclusive and, and more diverse. Um, and the other thing I think is that it's really, really important to have strategic ambition or intent behind mm -hmm. those plans in order to gain business buy-in because, you know, otherwise it just becomes another HR initiative or another you know, pet project of the CEO. And um, that's when you end up with those tick box exercises that you talked about before. But if you've got some real strategic intent behind it and you can demonstrate the business benefits of being more inclusive and diverse, 
then you're more likely to get the uh, the right people within the organization um, mm. behind it. So um, the other thing that we've that we've learned is that you have to get the foundations right. I talked before about um, you know policies and and support structures. And to be honest, that's not my favorite thing to do. I'm mm. not I'm not a policy writer. I'm, it's not my favorite <laughs> thing to sit there and you know write policies to support the organization. I'm you know I'm much more excited about programs and you know building capability. But it's really important to have those policies in place mm. first because. Uh, without them, you just won't create that environment for people to feel like they can be themselves and really thrive in the organization. It, it sets the foundations. And for some people, if not all, um, it really, they need to see those things done as well to kind of see they are taking this serious. Um, so I think that's important. Yeah. Um, and Louisa, if people want to learn more about Colts culture um, and the activities you're doing, the initiatives you've got in place um, and what's coming next as well, where could people go to find out more? Uh, you can go to um, a few places. We have um, a lot of information on our website. So cult.net is the, is the place to go. We have a whole section on inclusion and diversity. Um, and maybe if I can just clarify, I know the common term is, is DNI or DEI. Um, yeah. We purposely start with inclusion because we believe that building an inclusive environment leads to greater diversity. Hmm. So uh, if you go to cult.net, you can find uh, a whole page. We've got um, some great things on there. We talk about our policies, we talk about our networks. We talk about, there's some blogs on there. I'm really proud of the fact that we've got our own podcast called uh, The Full Picture, where we give our people a platform and a voice to speak about their own personal stories when it comes to diversity. Um, we've got a Humans of Cult series, again, giving them a, a platform to, to talk about that um, as well. But there's there's loads of resources on our and our website um, and LinkedIn. As you as you mentioned earlier, we do uh, put quite a lot of resource on there um, as well. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to see where you guys come up next. Um, and I really <laughs> like the idea of the translation within the company's platforms. I know it's something so simple and you've said so many great things, but that's one. <laughs> the one thing, yeah. yeah. And it's it's all, it's fully automated. You just, yeah. um, you literally, and it's on cult.net. So you can go on to cult.net and it's it's called uh, Recite Me um, up the top or accessible, no, it's, sorry, it's not called Recite mm. Me. It's called Accessibility. You just click on that and it gives you all the options about yeah. what you can do. You can change the background color. Some people can't do white screens. You can change it to dark. You can change the font color. Um, yeah, there's hundreds of languages on there as well. So <laughs> yeah, I'm sure a lot of corporations will have to copy that because it's one of those you really have to. Well, Recite um, Me is the tool. We didn't build it. We, we bought it. So um, no, I know, but a have little, little plug for Recite Me there. <laughs> um, okay, Louisa, well, thank you so much for talking to us and sharing the experiences at Colt. Um, and thank you, our viewers, as well, for tuning into JSA TV and JSA Podcast. And don't forget to check our social media channels for more content. Until next time, happy networking.